When a libel case goes to court, it is the responsibility of the plaintiff to initiate the action. Attorneys for the plaintiff must produce evidence to prove that the offending material was published, that it identified the plaintiff, that the words tended to be defamatory, that those words caused actual injury and were false. The plaintiff must also prove that the material was published with some degree of culpability, that is, that there was negligence on part of the defendant or that the defendant published with actual malice. We have discussed the first five elements in the burden of proof. We will now discuss fault in this lecture, actual malice, in the next lecture, negligence. Actual malice, for our purposes, had its birth on March 29, 1960. On that day, the New York Times published a full-page ad placed by the, by the Committee to Defend Martin Luther King and the Struggle for Freedom in the South. The ad, pictured here, was titled, Heed Their Rising Voices, and solicited funds to assist Dr. King, particularly in his defense against perjury charges filed in connection with his state income tax returns. He was eventually exonerated. The ad contained the names of members of the committee, including a number of well-known celebrities, Harry Belafonte, Marlon Brando, Diane Carroll, Nat King Cole, Ozzie Davis, Sammy Davis Jr., Tony Francioso, Maureen Stapleton, Van Heflin, Eleanor Roosevelt, and others. The ad also contained the names of some not so well-known clergymen in the South. The text of the ad, 10 paragraphs, describes certain activities in the South that the sponsors believe to be attempts to inhibit the civil rights movement. They call these attempts an unprecedented wave of terror. In Montgomery, Alabama, residents objected in particular to two paragraphs. First, in Montgomery, Alabama, after students sang My Country Tis of Thee on the state capitol steps, their leaders were expelled from school, and truckloads of police armed with shotguns and tear gas ringed the Alabama State College campus when the entire student body protested to state authorities by refusing to re-register. Their dining hall was padlocked in an attempt to starve them into submission. And, second, again and again Southern violators have answered Dr. King's peaceful protest with intimidation and violence. They have bombed his home, almost killing his wife and child. They have assaulted his person. They have arrested him seven times for speeding, loitering, and similar offenses. And now they have charged him with perjury, a felony under which they could imprison him for 10 years. Obviously, the, their real purpose is to remove him physically as the leader to whom the students and millions of others look for guidance and support and to thereby to intimidate all leaders who may raise in the South. As I said, the ad caused a stir in Alabama, particularly in Montgomery, among a very few number of residents. The newspaper there didn't like it that this Yankee know-it-all newspaper was coming into the South with these kinds of criticisms. Editorial attacks were la launched against the Times at King and at committee members, particularly the four clergymen from Atlanta who were listed as being among the supporters of the ad. The same editorial writers were partly responsible with prompting a series of libel actions against the Times. Eventually, each of the three public service commissioners in Montgomery and the governor of Alabama filed libel actions against those four clergymen and against the New York Times. The governor dropped his suit when the Times ran a correction saying that the ad did not relate to him. The suit by L.B. Sullivan was the first to come to trial. He was not named in the ad, but claimed he was identified, but identified because the ad was critical of police in Montgomery and he was the public service commissioner responsible for the police department. There were obviously some factual errors in the ad. Students sang, the national anthem, for example, not My Country Tis of Thee. No one was expelled for singing, but some students were expelled for a protest in the county court, at the county courthouse on another day. 
Truckloads of police did not ring the campus. The entire student body did not protest. The dining hall was not padlocked, and only those students who had not received their meal tickets were not allowed to eat. These seem like minor errors, but they were problems because the rule of the law was strict liability. If something was wrong, injury was presumed and liability followed. Sullivan won $500,000, all that he asked for. At trial, he called only about a dozen witnesses. Most had not seen the ad until it was shown to them by Sullivan's attorneys. Indeed, the Times circulated only about 360 issues of that copy of the paper in Alabama, and only about 35 in Montgomery. No one testified that he believed the material in the ad to be true. Each testified that he would have thought less of Sullivan if he had believed the ad, but no one believed it. There were also some other interesting aspects about the trial. However, the Alabama Supreme Court affirmed the verdict. There was no First Amendment issue, the court ruled, because the published material was false, and false libels were not protected by the First Amendment. The verdict and the state ruling were in line with libel law at the time, which was controlled entirely by state law. The attorney for Sullivan was so confident he would win when the case was appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States that he told me once at a conference, the only way for us to lose would be for the Supreme Court to change libel law. And that's what happened. The court reversed the Alabama Supreme Court ruling in an opinion that remains the most important libel opinion in history and probably the most important opinion on any area of free speech law. Justice Brennan wrote the majority, and the heart of his opinion was the pronouncement that public officials could not win libel cases brought against criticism of their public duties unless they could prove actual malice. Actual malice was defined by the court as knowledge of falsity or reckless disregard for the truth. That is, a public official in order to win a libel action must prove that the publisher of the defamatory material either lied or was so reckless that it was obvious the publisher did not care about the truth or falsity of the material being published. <clears throat> there were several reasons for the holding. First, the court found that the right to criticize government is more than a right. It is a duty. Each citizen has a duty to criticize the government that is as binding as the duty of those in government to govern. Examining history, the court found that protection of this duty is at the central meaning of the First Amendment. To punish the criticism would be a type of seditious libel, which is illegal in the United States. Second, the burden for a public official in a libel case should be greater than that of a private person. The public official voluntarily enters into a position of influence. He or she has greater access to the media, so the public official can easily respond. The public official is protected from some libel suits based on publication that based on the publication of comments made by the public official in the official capacity. Third, even false statements of fact are protected because falsity is inevitable in the course of public debate. It would chill this public debate if every citizen was required to prove in court that every statement the citizen made in the course of such a public debate was in fact true. There were no dissents. Two justices wrote concurring opinions saying that public officials should never be able to win libel actions, but the, but the court as a whole did not go that far. Until 1964, malice was generally thought of in terms of ill will, hatred, or contempt. 
It had been involved, evolving into what was called actual malice, however, and the court put the cap on that evolution. Actual malice under Times v. Sullivan is knowledge of falsity or reckless disregard for the truth. What was remarkable about Times v. Sullivan, however, was that this was the first time that libel law was constitutionalized. That is, the rules of libel law were brought under the First Amendment. The next questions, of course, are what is knowledge of falsity and what is reckless disregard for the truth? Knowledge of falsity is easier to define than reckless disregard, but it's probably harder to prove. A plaintiff must show that the publisher was lying, that the publisher published falsehoods knowing at the time of publication that they were in fact false. What the publisher may have learned subsequent to publication is irrelevant. Barry Goldwater, Goldwater the Republican senator from Arizona, was able to convince a, convince a federal jury that Ralph Ginsburg lied when Ginsburg published what he called a psychobiography of Goldwater during Goldwater's 1964 run for the presidency. He published an article saying Goldwater was mentally ill, that he was schizophrenic. Goldwater, I'm sorry, Ginsburg and his co-author only used material from questionnaires they sent around the country to psychiatrists that fit their predetermined profile. Indeed, one witness for Goldwater testified that the outline of the article was put together before the questionnaires were even returned. In addition, Carol Burnett's lawyers were able to prove knowledge of falsity against the National Enquirer when they demonstrated that despite the fact that a reporter proved that the publication that was going to be made had not occurred, the Supreme Court has made it very clear that knowledge of falsity only applies to what the publisher knew at the time of publication. If you know that it's false at the time of publication, that is knowledge of falsity. Reckless disregard for the truth is not as easy to define as knowledge of falsity, but it can often be easier to prove because it is based upon the actions that a publisher took or did not take. Reckless disregard is tantamount to lying. The recklessness was so great that the, it's clear that the publisher did not care whether the material was true or false. The Supreme Court has said that, knowledge of, that like knowledge of falsity, reckless disregard is a subjective standard. An objective standard is one that focuses on the method and techniques rather than the attitude. A subjective standard, however, does focus on the attitude. The question is, what did the publisher intend by publishing the material? There was an intent to harm through falsehood. It's not necessary that the publisher dislike the subject of the publication, only that the publisher intended to harm and did not care whether, whether the material was true or false. Jim Garrison, the district attorney for Orleans Parish, was found in contempt of court when he criticized the judges of that parish, parish for being what he said were, was too lazy. The Supreme Court found the law under which he was convicted unconstitutional and applied the actual malice test to criminal law. Garrison did not speak out against the judges with reckless disregard for the truth. Reckless disregard for the truth has been defined as publishing with a high degree of awareness of probable falsity, publishing though the defendant in fact entertained serious doubts as to the truth of the publication, and the purposeful avoidance of the truth. A key reckless disregard case was Curtis Publishing Company versus Butts. 
In that case, the Saturday Evening Post published a story in which it said that Wally Butts of the University of Georgia and Bear Bryant of Alabama had conspired to fix the outcome of the Alabama-Georgia football game. The court found that the publication was made with reckless disregard for the truth. This is what John Marshall Harlan wrote. The evidence showed that the Butts story was in no sense hot news, and the editors of the magazine recognized the need for a thorough investigation of the serious charges. Elementary precautions were nevertheless ignored. The Saturday Evening Post knew that Burnett had been placed on probation in connection with bad check charges, but proceeded to publish the story on the basis of his affidavit without substantial independent support. Burnett had told the magazine that he had overheard by some electronic fluke a conversation between Butts and Bear Bryant in which they accomplished the alleged fix that information had been exchanged between the two. Justice Harlan continues, Burnett's notes were not even viewed by any of the magazine's personnel prior to publication. John Carmichael, who was supposed to have been with Burnett when the phone call was overheard, was not interviewed. No attempt was made to screen the films of the game to see if Burnett's information was accurate, and no attempt was made to find out whether Alabama had adjusted its plans after the alleged divulgence of information. The Post writer assigned to the story was not a football expert, and no attempt was made to check the story with someone knowledgeable in the sport. At trial, such experts indicated that the information in the Burnett notes was either such that it would be evident to any opposing coach from game films regularly exchanged or useless. The investigation did not stand up to scrutiny. Therefore, the Saturday Evening Post had published with reckless disregard for the truth. Compare that story to associate that case to Associated Press versus Walker, a case that was joined with the Butts case and handed down at the same time. The Associated Press reported that Major General Edwin Walker, a retired general, led a mob of whites against federal marshals attempting to preserve order at the University of Mississippi during the enrollment of the first African American to attend that school, James Meredith. Though there were some inaccuracies in the AP dispatch, there were some significant differences between the scenarios in the two cases. The reporter in the Walker story was a veteran stringer who had a history of reliable reporting. The stringer in the Walker case, in the Butts case, I'm, I'm sorry, the source in the Butts case was unreliable, whereas the stringer in the Walker case was a veteran with a reliable history. The Post had ample time to double check the story, but did not. The AP story was on deadline. There were some red flags in the Butts story. Butts had a reputation of being a man of integrity. Burnett didn't. In the Walker story, the actions of Walker were in line with his somewhat questionable reputation. Reckless disregard, then, has to do with extreme outlandish behavior, obvious fault on the part of the journalist. Simple failure to investigate is not sufficient evidence of reckless disregard. The examination of the conduct of the publisher is important because of what it says about the subjective nature of the publisher's state of mind. Is the publisher out to get the subject so much so that the publisher is willing to use material that is likely to be false? One final reckless disregard case. Hardhanks Communications versus Connaughton. The facts of the case are a little tricky. Dan Connaughton was running for municipal judge against an incumbent whose name was Dolan. 
Patsy Stevens was a former employee in the municipal court system. She took information to Connaughton about alleged misconduct on the part of Dolan and Dolan's court administrator, a man named Billy Joe New. Stevens gave Connaughton that information in what was nearly an all-night interview in Connaughton's home. In addition to the two of them, Stevens' sister, Alice Thompson, was present, as were four of Connaughton's campaign aides. About six weeks later, after the Cincinnati Inquirer refused to publish a story, Thompson contacted the Hamilton Journal News with information she believed to be newsworthy. Remember that Thompson is the sister, not the former employee, so Thompson did not have first-hand knowledge. That information, according to Thompson, was that Connaughton was only interested in information from Stevens so he could force Dolan and New to resign, that he would give the two women, that is Stevens and Thompson, a Florida vacation in exchange for their help, that he would give them jobs in a restaurant he was going to open, that he would take them on a victory celebration after he won the election, that he would keep their involvement secret. This all-night interview was taped. At one point, Thompson told reporters that her sister would corroborate her story, and at another point she equivocated. Later, Connaughton went into the newspaper office for a routine interview about his candidacy. After the interview, he was asked about Thompson's allegations, which he denied. Her account, he said, was obviously shaded and bizarre. He reported that some discussions could have been greatly exaggerated, though they might have been on point, and he also said that Stevens would corroborate his version of the story. Indeed, he offered the newspaper the tapes from the interview. The newspaper's managing editor assigned a group of reporters to interview all the witnesses to the, to the interview in Connaughton's home, with the exception of of Patsy Stevens. She was not interviewed. All witnesses denied Thompson's account and corroborated Connaughton. In addition, the reporters at the Journal News did not listen to tapes of the interview. The Journal News then published an account of the charges against Connaughton, along with Connaughton's denial and his version of the story. What's wrong with this picture? The Supreme Court found for Connaughton. The key was the failure by the newspaper to listen to the tapes or to interview Stevens. Both Thompson and Connaughton said Stevens would corroborate their version of the story, but the paper did not bother to interview her. This omission, the court said, is utterly bewildering in light of the fact that the journal news committed substantial resources to investigating Thompson's claims, yet chose not to interview the one witness who was most likely to confirm Thompson's account of the event. But, the court said, the omission is easy to understand if the newspaper had serious doubts about the story but wanted to publish it anyway in order to simply publish a sensational story. It is likely that the newspaper's inaction was a product of a deliberate decision not to acquire knowledge of facts that might confirm the probable falsity of Thompson's charges. Although failure to investigate will not alone support a finding of actual malice, the purposeful avoidance of the truth is in a different category. That different category is reckless disregard for the truth. Both knowledge of falsity and reckless disregard are subjective standards. That is, they are the kinds of standards that allow a publisher to consider the actions that allow actions of the publisher to be considered in the putting together of information that is to be published. 
The Supreme Court has said that when a court is considering the existence of actual malice, it must consider the nature of the investigation and the seriousness of the charges. These are important. If the more serious the charges are, the more an investigation is required. The need for the rapid dissemination of the information should be considered. Failure to investigate standing alone is insufficient for a finding of actual malice, and the number and veracity of, sto of sources are important. Finally, testimony alone may be insufficient to show belief in the truth. What that means is, if the publisher testifies that he or she genuinely believed the material to be true, that testimony is sufficient unless there is evidence to the contrary.